So normally when we talk about geological storage of CO2, we're interested in depth below around 800 metres. So obviously it depends on the temperature and the pressure in the basin itself. But overall, when we talk about storage, we're going to be looking below 800 metres, so it's nothing shallow. So one of the common misconceptions, when we talk about underground storage, I've seen this on TV as well. People show a picture of an oil field and they show this big underground cabin half full of oil and it is just not like that. It's only in the map simple. So in the same way that the oil is trapped in the port of the rock and some space between the mineral grains, we want to put the CO2 into those spaces. So when I talk about porosity, I'm talking about the spaces between the grains. When I talk about permeability, I'm talking about the spaces that link the space is pain great, so the fluid can pass through the rock. So in terms of potential reservoir rocks, there's two main types we consider. We consider the sandstone, which might be deposited in deserts, or there might be marine sandstone. So those are largely made of quartz. So you would be very familiar with quartz because it's used to make glass. So these are very sort of clean sandstones, so they've got lots of space. For us to store CO2. The other formations that we might consider are limestones. But limestones react to acid, so something we have to consider if we use limestones for storage is how will the CO2 react because it will start to dissolve the reservoir rock. So we have to consider what will the consequences of this be could the minerals um, precipitate back out of the fluid, in which case they actually block up and cause the problem so that we can't detect them on CO2. So many of the demonstrations consider sandstone reservoirs because it is that much easier. Something else that we also consider is where will that sandstone <coughs> come to So, for example, in the UK we have some very nice sandstone, it's a very thick, 10 centimetres. They're quite clean and there's not too many shales in them. Now, shale is quite an important rock in terms of CO2 storage because it has low permeability, which means it's difficult for fluid to pass through it. And this is quite important because we want to have something at the top of our reservoir to prevent the CO2 from going through. When we saw the CO2 at depth, it's oil and fluid, the same way that oil and gas are, so we can try to rise to the surface. So we have to make sure that we have a good seal over the top. And share with one of the rocks that we commonly like to see over the top of the reservoir because it's a good seal. So in this case, though, and as you can see on the right, we have the sandstone which were deposited in the river environment. As you know, the channels of the river move around, so we get lots of different rocks. We call it intermedic. So we have a bed of sandstone, a bed of shale. And this means that it would be quite difficult to inject the CO2 into these rocks. Because we, we want to store the sandstone, so the shale is just going to get in our way in that case. So we're looking for a very special kind of rocks. We're looking for nice rocks with good frosting good permeability so that we can check the CO2. So another part, important part of the address by fractures is, is what happens after the rocks have been deposited. So you've all seen the sand grains on the beach, they're all loose, you can run running through your fingers. So after that's been buried and it's compressed, that turns into sandstone, which is cemented together, so it becomes a rock. So that process is called diagenesis. That is the difference between the sand, the loose and consolidated sand on the beach and the sandstone rock. So we still want to know what rock there is, but one of the difficulties can be that we can get minerals growing in between those different grains of sand, and that can block up frost and permeability. So we want to know what happened to those rocks when they were deposited, what's their history like. And we're also quite interested in the microbiology in the reservoir now. We're doing some experimental work in PDF that shows that microbes in the reservoir can actually be quite important. For example, there was a demonstration in Ketsin where they injected the CO2 and it previously that site, a deeper part of that succession of rocks had been used for gas storage, so there were some microbes from that. They used an organic drilling one when they drilled the borehole and there were some microbes which were around when they injected the CO2 with all these microbes together. The microbes don't really like sort of dry environment, and they like to make it sort of fly and they can live in. And this blocked up the grain, the space between the grains, so 
which cause problems with injectivity in the test, so it's difficult to get the signature with. So we're doing some experiments at work which back up this idea that actually microbes in the reservoir are important. So we have to consider, in some cases, they could they use biocides to kill off the microbes, but it doesn't apparently seem to be too successful. So it's a new area of research for CPS, and it's something we're quite interested in. So when I talk about geological storage, one of the things that we're particularly interested in is trying to find structures where we can control where the sewage is going to go so we can understand what's going to happen. So on the left, you can see we have an uncontrolled aquifer, so it's open at both ends. The O2 has injected in, it's going to flow, and it's, it's going to cover a large area, which is a problem for us if we want to be able to observe where the CO2 has gone to. It needs to go to have to monitor a much larger area, which is going to be much more expensive. So in terms of storage, what we're really looking for is what's called the closure. So on the right, you can see there's an ice stone, and the void of CO2 is rising to the top of the stone, and it's trapped. So when I talk about traps, there's different kinds of traps. Sometimes we have CO2 trapped in an ice stone or trap. Other times it could be trapped. Again, it's a geological fault, so you can see the red line in the middle here. In this case, it's false ceiling, which is another geological complication. Sometimes those faults will be. So when we look into site storage, we have to be very careful to look at the faults and to try to understand the properties. If there are any faults, could they allow the CO2 to escape? For example, we might look for oil staining. So if we see that there is oil stain in the rocks, we might try to understand where that oil has gone. Because if there's a fault, there's oil staining, we may well find that the oil has migrated at the fault. So this is not a good sign for CO2 storage. Can't <coughs> so I said something that's often not talked about in, that, in when we look at storage line. It's the seal characteristic. So what we're looking for is this nice and permeable rock. So we want it to cover a large area. We want it to be nice and continuous, no breaks in it, nice and thick and unfolded. It's very important that it's low permeability. It's difficult for the fluid to pass through it. And we want a high slurry entry pressure. That's the pressure at which the fluid can force its way through. This is going to be different for different fluids. So, for example, we might have a shell that water can pass through, but see if we can't. So some of the experimental work we do at BGS is considering how much CO2 could you trap into this. So, what's the height of the column of CO2 that you could trap underneath this shell? And there has to be non reactive with the CO2. This obviously is going to be no good if we consider a rock that's impermeable. CO2 might dissolve because the CO2 mix mixes with water and forms carbonic acid. So this can dissolve any minus two. So in summary, what makes a good storage site? So we need something quite deep, preferably something below 800 meters, but not too deep because as the rocks get more and more deeply buried, we start to lose the porosity as they get more and more compressed and pressure of the rocks above them. We need good frost in our reservoir, we need good permeability, and we need an extensive and permeable seal at the top. And something that I haven't mentioned before that you will hear geologists talk about a lot is we need lots of information to reduce our uncertainty around the site. So something you will very often hear us complain about is not enough data. So this is one advantage to looking at oil fields. Generally they've been pretty well explored and it's been quite well understood. But some of the large capacity of storage that we have is an aspect. So rocks to contain a saving fluid. And the problem with that is because they're not commercially interested, it's generally not very much data. So we have other trapping mechanisms as well. I mentioned to you the structural trapping. But we also have the CO2 migrate through the reservoir, a little bit into left behind. So we call that residual trapping. We have geochemical trapping over time. CO2 will dissolve into the pore water. This is actually quite dense, so it will sink back down to the bottom of the reservoir. And over time, this will mineralize that or carbonate minerals. So, to give you an idea of the time scale, so over 10 of the years, you can see the CO2 dissolving into the pore water. Over hundreds of thousands of years, we start to see mineral traps, we start to see the CO2 form into mineral solids. So we think of the site as moving towards long-term stability because once the CO2 is um, taken out of the 
underground coal gas location in the UK because the home has not been a popular technology yet. So I'm going to talk about one of the screening criteria, which is the capacity for storage. So we consider how much CO2 we actually get in the ground. But the different scales of storage, so we might consider it on a country scale effect, and we might do a basic scale effect, which is what we've done for India in this report, and I'm going to talk about shortly. And the traditional scale effect, which is where you start to get more and more detail, but it requires more and more data. So, for example, when we start to get down to the regional and local scale, we're looking for seismic data, which is using pathways to image the rock on the surface. So I'm going to briefly mention a little bit about estimating capacity. So we're going all the way from simple back of the envelope calculations, where we just know a little bit about the old school of the stone, a bit about the size of the reservoir, we know if it's got any oil or gas in it, all the way up to 3D modeling, or even 4D modeling like a plant, which is when we do a 3D model several times over. But of course, the more complicated your model, the more data you need, the more time, the more resources, the more money it costs. So there is no completely accepted formula for an estimated capacity, but the carbon sequestration leadership one is quite a simple one, and it's very similar to the US Department of Energy model, but it's essentially volumetric, looking at how much space is there between the rock roads. And this is considered the storage space similar to an oil or gas when we talk about the difference between resources, which is how much there is to reserves, which is how much we actually think we can get out of that, and how much this is actually useful. So we talk about theoretical capacity, which is just how much space is there in our storage site. We move up to effective capacity. We start to consider geology, we start to consider, well, do I actually think I can use all that space? So if we considered an oil field, for example, we might say that maybe we could use even with 60% of that space, you can produce a lot more bits, you can get in even a little bit more. But if we're looking at an aquifer, where we don't have the advantage of reducing pressure, we've got to push all this water out of the way. Although it's a huge space, perhaps we could only use a few percent of it. Then we move up to practical capacity, which is considering things like how close is this to your sources, how economic is it, all the regulations that allow us to do this, and finally, the much capacity or practical uh, match capacity, which is when we have for storage sites and our source when we link the two together. So when we consider how much CO2 we can store in a source of hydrocarbon fuel, the main assumption is that the space that was occupied by the oil can now be built with CO2. And so we assume that we will only get the pressure of the oil to build back up to where it was when it was originally full of oil. So in some sites, perhaps that might be an interest, but perhaps they could even take more CO2. But something else that we have to consider is as we extract the oil, could we have managed to seal it at the top? Um, in terms of filling the site, we might try and put a little bit more CO2 in there if we decide it's safe, and we might fill it up to the spill point. So I talked earlier about closures and how we want to make sure that we store the CO2 in the closure or environment where we can understand where it's going to go and make sure that it's going to stay there. So in terms of oil and gas here, we want a high variety. So the space in between grains, we need it to be typically over 20%. So in some cases, we do consider a high to lower variety. We want a high permeability. We want to be sure that the world's not going to allow the CO2. And if we're going to do the CO2 BOR, we need to be sure that the oil has suitable characteristics. In terms of back of the storage, we have to be comfortable that we're going to be able to displace the water. So we're displacing the same water. One of the important um, potential conflicts of interest is that we would not consider storing in a drinking water aquifer because obviously drinking water is very fresh. There's a very small percentage of the world's water which is fresh water suitable for drinking. So we wouldn't want to manage that as well either. So when we talk about geological storage in aquifers, we're considering saline aquifers. And we're looking for traps and we're looking for a very limited flow of saline water as well because CO2 will dissolve into that saline water. What we don't want is that fluid to make its way back up to the surface or to damage 
potable water aquifers. We talk about storage in unmindful coals, so the CO2 needs to absorb onto the coal, and this displaces the coal bed beneath it. And you can actually get points more, you can get um, more methane out than you get CO2 in. So for some of the coals and for other coals, you find that you get you get more CO2 in and less methane out. It depends on the type of coal, so we're quite a lot of studies about how coal reacts with the CO2. But one of the issues is that because this coal CO2 is going on, because we're getting more CO2 into the coal, it actually makes the coal swell that reduces the permeability. So to give an example of this, I had a look at um, how much sort of typical recovery rates for the coal bed need then. And if I wanted to inject the CO2 emissions from a typical power station, I would actually keep thousands of the world. If I assume that perhaps I can get four times the amount of CO2 in compared to the methane amount. So it really doesn't look too promising to me. And of course, one of the other big issues with coal is that's an economic energy reserve resource. So how do I decide that this coal is going to remain in that economic in the future? So I'm going to move on to talking about the geological storage potential of India based on the report when we assessed on the basis scale what we thought the storage potential of India would be. And I apologise in advance if I mispronounce any of these things. So we considered basins right across India. This is a summary map showing you where we considered that storage could be carried out. Basins in red are where we thought they had good potential. Basins in sort of orange and yellow are where we thought there was fair potential. And green basins are where we thought there was limited potential. Sometimes this doesn't reflect the geology, sometimes it reflects the conflict of interest or a simple lack of data. So in terms of the storage potential in the oil fields, based on the ones that we could find in papers where we could see the amounts, we estimated that there were 835 million tons of storage in the oil fields that we could see. But from the to be more certain about the seals, which I said before was plenty of issues with storing in cars. In terms of aquifer storage, one of the criteria that we used is we considered if there were oil and gas fields which demonstrated that there was suitable reservoir and field formation. And also the extent of these aquifers. So for us this was quite useful in terms of considering could we do aquifer storage in any of these basins. So the exam field, it had some potentially porous and permeable formations that we held between 7 and 30% porosity, which sounded quite promising. But one of the issues here is with earthquakes, with a magnitude greater than 80 being recorded, which is a huge earthquake. Now, in terms of storage, we're not thinking that that's really an issue, but in terms of public perception, it tends to be. So, for example, in Japan, though, they had a final site, mm -hmm. and they injected CO2. It was a really large earthquake. In fact, I'm told that there was a tank of CO2 at the top of the hill when they injected the CO2. The earthquake was so large that the tank actually ended up at the bottom of the hill. But the CO2 that was underground was not disturbed at all because the rock unit that contained the CO2 just moved between the earthquake. So it didn't the earthquake didn't have any influence at all on the underground storage of the CO2. So I think when we were concerned about the earthquake, often we're more concerned about the public perception in terms of will the CO2 leave rather than it actually having any real issues with the CO2 storage, other than perhaps it might upset our injection infrastructure. There's also the possibility of um, aquifer storage in this basin because we can see the oil and gas fields which indicate that there's porous and terminal formation of death. In terms of the fault smell, there's some very thick sedimentary sequences. So there's only two formations of sediment, so somewhere in that there's sure to be some potential storage. We see oil and gas fields again, which gives us some encouragement that there's going to be some potential formations. But we think, based on what we see from the oil from this, that overpression might be an issue. So we might find that the pressure is quite high, we might not be able to inject CO2 
The only problem is this was quite different from the main ones in here from the sources that we're trying to store. So we also consist the Bengal Basin. So I'm sure it might have some storage. But it's very difficult to see any proven seals here and proven enclosures. So we only classify it as a four in the Indian part of the basin. So you can see on the right we have a diagram of the rock units. So we use the yellow dotty uh, colours to indicate that's the sandstone, the ones that look like new bricks and limestone. So those are our potential storage rocks. As you can see over the top there's some grey with black lines, that's our shales. So we do have some potential rice rocks and steel rocks, but we're not too confident about the seal. So without more data we can't find that to support potential. In the Mahanadi Basin, uh, we think there are good reservoir rocks and having some significant gas discoveries. So we see the sunstones and carbonates have some good properties of 15 to 25 percent. We thought this had fair potential. But the answer was a little bit less certain based on the data that we were able to see for this one. In the Krishna Godavari Basin, we thought the sunstone was sealed by shells and had good potential both on an offshore. Um, it's got a very prolific hydrocarbon basin, so it extends offshore past the 200 metre isomer. So when we go offshore, the storage becomes more expensive, but sometimes it's easier for public perception issues because it's not being stored on, on land. So it depends where you are. I, I spoke to someone from Texas who said, well, actually, people here would be really upset if you try to do ocean storage because they, they will wash out on whales and dolphins. Whereas for the UK, I think it's kind of linked to the oil and gas industry because the UK, we're talking about offshore storage, and that's where our oil and gas is, and people seem to be fairly comfortable with that. Texas, it's all onshore, so they're kind of used to the pipes and the drilling. Whereas if you went offshore, I think they'd be quite upset, but it's just onshore storage in Texas, and apparently they're not too, too worried. But obviously, that's quite a limited survey, so we would have to go out and do more public outreach programs. So we also considered the carbon basin. So this shows some oil and gas tax, so we can see both structural and stratigraphic traffic. So this looks like a very promising basin. Um, you can see some sandstones, good porosity, and some interbedded fields. But we can also see that this sandstone is quite variable because the ocean um, transgress, i.e. washed over the land and set. So the land is being stood under the ocean and above the ocean several times we've had transgressions and progressions. So we've got some conformity to the succession, but we would need to look at the geology in detail to make sure it's suitable. Mumbai Basin, um, in this case, it's got over 5 kilometers in the sewer depression of sediments. So somewhere there we hope there will be storage. It looks as if there's great aquifer potential. And it looks as if there's a shale catwalk which would form a good regional seal over the whole area set around the Gibby Rock. There's also a lot of oil, oil produced from this. So the estimated oil is when we did the report was 4 billion barrels, 7.4 terrific feet gas. So in this case, most of these storage formations are the carbonates, but that looked very promising basin. The Cambay basin is also very special for the basin. This also looked very promising in terms of storage. The sediments are up to 11.6, so we really think there could be good potential here. And we have lots of information from oil exploration. That gave a lot of confidence to base this base that's having good potential. The Bomber base is an extension of the Cambay base. This also has a lot of oil and possibly the potential for enhanced oil recovery. Um, it looks as if they estimate at the time that perhaps 90% of the oil in place could be recovered with water body. So it would be quite interesting to know that it would actually be exploited with um, the CO2 flooding, which is often carried out as uh, what's known as a whack flood, water on the gap, so CO2 and water are indebted in ways to kind of push the oil out. In the Dick Summer Basin, this has got green fluvial sediments, 
and again it's got hydrocarbon fields. So we took this to mean that there were formations of suitable depth that could store CO2. And the northwest quantities had very good potential for storing CO2. In terms of the Mississippi memoir basin, there's some heavy crude oil and there's a sediment zone 1500 meters thick. So we think that this is storage both in Tanskin and some dollar sense, which is similar to one sense with a carbon of rock. So we thought this one also shows some storage potential. The Chattisgar and Kudapa basins, um, we didn't think there was enough information really to assess these properly. But we also looked at the age of the rocks and we thought <coughs> things are so old, it's quite likely to be very deeply very decompressed. So there weren't two options to be found in space and in terms of storage. The Bintian Basin has a big succession of Bintian supergroup. The seismic data suggested it might have poor porosity, but given the seismic data, it seems a bit kind of too much light to come completely. And there's also some good shale seeds could form good cap rocks if they're not fractured. Um, the Gangar Basin, um, although this has a lot of sunstone units, we were a bit concerned because the seals over the top of these seem to be a bit discontinuous. And this is an important area for aquifers for drinking water and agricultural water. So we wrote this down as a poor potential basin due to the potential conflict of interest. So it's mainly down to the steel forest because we were very confident that they would be continuous. So although there's three kilometers of concession, which looked quite promising for storage, we were a bit concerned that they wouldn't be able to trap the CO2 safely. Um, Put it on shelf, we thought the same thing. We thought it had very limited cap rock. And it also had a lot of aquifers which supplied agricultural water. So that was no good in terms of storage. The Kankan Kerala Basin. Um, the onshore sedimentary thickness was really a bit too thin to be of interest for storage, but there might be um, some opportunities in the deeper parts of the basin, and we did look to the problems of cat rocks. But we raised this as limited to the law, largely due to the lack of information, but also because we were a bit uncertain about the permeability of the frost in this basin. In terms of the catch basin, we thought the shallow marine sediments, which was light sediments, shells, and sand sediments, was quite promising. Um, but one of the issues is the second tracks for the sand friction. We would have to penetrate through those hard basalt rocks if you wanted to store CO2. The, the Mar de Grava, the western part of the thick sediments, but it's got those hydrocarbons, so we don't have proof of field for, um, and forest formations of depth. The Sarastra Basin is covered by the depth.